Okay, welcome everybody to uh, Monday, December 21st, our first meeting on this series of calls that we're going to do. Uh, this is more or less a get-together, uh, get familiar with everything. Uh, everything is brand new. Uh, we got a lot of different stuff, but we're working on some technologies and things with just uh, getting access to the Internet and so we can share documents. And so we're going to have to be learning a uh, brand new learning curve as well as, you know, the stuff that we're going to be presenting. So. These first couple of calls are going to be kind of slow, maybe to begin with. So, but anyway, this, this call was to learn how to negotiate NDIs, and really, the the, the title to the call is uh, kind of a misnomer because it's really not true and correct. Because really, we're not negotiating these NDIs, and it's, 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 we're going to have to like forget about everything that we've really learned in the past, and which really pertains to debtor-credit relationship under UCC and, and uh, Article 3 negotiable instruments, because we're not talking about really negotiable instruments. We're not negotiating them, and that's really been the problem all along. We've been treating these private credit documents, these non-negotiable debt instruments, as negotiable, and we've been trying to negotiate them on the public side through UCC Article 3. And every time we've done that, what we've done is we just created more public debt. And everything we've done in the past has really been backwards. So we need a whole paradigm shift from the way we've been thinking in the past, and we need to start thinking outside the box with a different kind of epistemology or a different way of thinking. Because everything we've done in the past, you might as well count it as being strictly under debtor-creditor, and you've been following a trail that has been led, you, that you've been led down, and you've been coerced to follow, and you haven't even known it. And all we've been doing is we've been parroting terms, following the crowd, and it's just like the, the, the nose ring on a bull is being led around the mountain, and that, that two-ton animal can be led anywhere with a nose ring. And also, I liken it to the bullfighter who out in the middle of the ring there. The bull is us, and the bull is always being deceived by a red cape to charge the red cape. And we've been, we're being led down a, a path, a primrose path, so to speak, with a limited amount of success on everything we've done because that's just the way they want it. Because none of us has really been smart enough. Now, I just received an article from somebody, one of the top teachers around, and it was about a 740-page document, chock full of information, and I know the fella. And uh, his first two pages, or his first two paragraphs, he talks nothing about uh, debtor-credit relationship. He talks about trust. Now, I know this fella, and I know that he knows that everything is he's talking about is trust and bonds. Trust, bonds, and insurance. But in the first two paragraphs, that's all he talks about, everything being trusts. But from... The second paragraph, as soon as he jumps into the third paragraph, all the way to the end of his 740-page dissertation of all the information he presents, is nothing more than a jump from that reality and down on a path of debt or creditor. And it can't be, because if we are doing business in trust all the time, trusts have got us deceived. They know it's trust. And they're leading us down to debtor-creditor because we really haven't expressed the trust. Now, some of you have probably been on this calls in the past, and you know what I've been talking about. But if there's anybody that, that is not on the past shows, you know, if you're new to this, you're, you're going to have to do some catching up. Uh, you'll have to get ask me for the uh, audio download. Send me an email at movingtitles at hushmail.com. Moving titles, that's one word, at hushmail.com. Send me a request for the audio downlinks, and I'll get you the uh, links for the NTT, which is New Trust Technology. And that's the path that we're pursuing. 
and everything we've done in the past from the time that we put in these negotiable debt instruments into the Treasury, which were all done wrong, everything we've done in the past has been wrong, only because we really weren't thinking about trust, because it really is all trust. And if you're not pursuing a path of trust, then you're pursuing a, a debt or credit relationship or some other relationship, and that's that's the that's the jump off point or the point that they deceive you at because you need to pursue debt or credit or not first directly because your remedy is not in debt or credit relationship as secured party creditor. Knowing who you are is not knowing that you're creditor. Knowing who you are is that you're grantor, grantor of a trust. The remedy is in trust and it's commerce through trust and equity. Now, I'm not saying that we need to forget about everything we've learned in debt or credit because we're going to apply that, but we're going to apply it down the road. First, we're going to set up trust. And through the trust, then we can interface into the public side through a straw man or an LLC, and we can do commerce through that, and we will do commerce in debt or credit relationship because you have to. If you're going to do commerce, commerce is the public. Debt or credit relationship is the public. In order to gain access to the colorable titles of the real substance held in the private, you have to come through the public. You have to come through debt or credit. So if I want to buy a car or I'm going to pay my electric bill, I'm going to have to come through debt or credit relationship. But I can't come through debt or credit relationship first. I first must have to establish trust position, become grantor, become... The, the head, 900-pound gorilla first, and then come into debtor-creditor functioning in the public in commerce through that, through trust. So I see some new people have joined on. So let me... Uh, uh, does anybody have a question? Uh, press star six to unmute yourself. Let's get somebody on here with a question. Pete, you got a question? Can you press star six and unmute? Presentation mode is on. Only organizers can be heard. Conversation mode is on. Everyone can now be heard. Okay, I just put off the conversation mode, so it's kind of scratchy, so. Are you out there? Can you hear me? Let me see if I can go back on Q&A mode and then press star six. Q&A mode is on. Participants may now unmute themselves. Okay, press star six, Pete. See if you can say something. See if I can hear you. Hello, Christian. Can there we go. You? Okay, yeah. Seems like on the conversation mode, there's a lot of background noise, so I won't be able to put it on conversation mode so that everybody could be heard. So uh, if I put it on question and answer, then each individual is going to have to uh, press star six to mute and unmute to ask a question. Yeah. So, have you, you got a question, Pete? You usually got some questions. <laughs> I can bring a few questions, yeah. Um, let's say, okay, for example, if we were to use a bond, just how coarse, as a grantor, could we use the bond for... How highly detailed do we need to be? Or well, know, just give us back. Uh, first of all, I think the bonds that we've been using in the past—they're all debtor creditors, and all we've been doing in, in debtor creditor is just creating a bigger debt, and we expect a bigger debt to pay another debt. So we've asking, we've been creating bigger debts to pay debt. So it's debt upon debt, and nothing gets paid. Right. But then it is a negotiable debt instrument. So is it? You know, we're not adding to the debt anyway, or? Yeah, well, here we go again. Uh, we're talking about a negotiable debt instrument. And anything that's negotiable 
is a public item. So if we have any kind of negotiable instrument, that's going to come under Article 3 of UCC and Article 8 and 9, and they're, they're, they're public documents. So we're back under debtor-credit relationship, and we just quelched our private credit. So we put it into the private. It then counted as an asset to both ourselves and the company who are holding it in trust. So there must be like a, a maturity date or a, um, you know, a date where if it's a promissory note where it's no longer valid after that time type of thing. Yeah, again, that's under debtor-creditor because we have a time limit under debtor-creditor of uh, your promissory notes have to be, say, nine months or less in order to be able to pay something or else they switch into, say, uh, secured party uh, Article 8 and 9 securities. But again, it comes back on our way that we've been taught to think because everything is a negotiable instrument and anything that's a negotiable instrument is a public instrument under debtor-creditor it's not private. So what we're talking about is the difference between non-negotiable and negotiable instruments. So what we want to do is we want to create strictly non-negotiable instruments which are private and then we want to make sure that we do not take these non-negotiable instruments and stick them back into the public and make them negotiable and fall under UCC or debtor-credit relationship again. And what we've effectively done is we've commingled the funds from the trust and we negated what, what our intent was and our purpose. We negated our intent and purpose by what we did, our actions. So we've been created, we've been trained to create under Article 3 UCC 8 and 9 negotiable debt instruments. No, we want to start creating non-negotiable debt instruments, or we want to just uh, non-negotiable strictly private, and we want to put okay. them in special deposit, or trust deposit. So what is holding the value on the, on the non-negotiable instruments? Well, the value is my signature whatever I want it to be. So, for example, if we had an item that we wanted to add value to, and we gave our signature to that, then we, we now have a res that we're going to deposit into a special deposit, something like that. Uh, yeah, you could be, it could be as simple as you could make out a money order or a promissory note for any amount of money that you want but it's non-negotiable, it's, it's private. And you're going to put that into special deposit, a trust deposit, which is held strictly on the private side. And as long as you don't commingle the funds back into the public, you're safe. But as soon as you come back in and you make it public in any way, by any kind of action, turning it into a negotiable instrument, then you're back in the same situation and you've got problems. You end up getting arrested. Yeah. Or could get arrested, let's put it that way. Yeah, because it, it's not completely true that you would. Is some people do use negotiable instruments in the public and use them all day long? Yeah, but there's a, there's there, there's a reason why only a certain percentage of them get through, and I don't care what method that anybody uses, it's still about the same rate of success. So that tells me it doesn't make any difference what you do. It's there just letting a certain amount through to keep you as the bull in the nose ring pulled around leading you around the mountain. So all of the like, legitimate negotiable instruments, say like there's an insurance company who are issuing bonds or, you know, the banks utilize and promise to be notes or however, so they're using the IMF special Jordan right to their back and for... Yeah, they're, they're operating solely on the public side with negotiable instruments. So I guess the big question is, where do we lodge these special deposits in the private then? Well, the uh, oh, I want to lodge them in my bank. 
which is the same as everybody else's private bank. But again, we've been doing it all wrong. Where, where would anybody think that they want to lodge one of these these instruments, one of these uh, non-negotiable instruments? Well, if you did it like we did in the past, we gave it to, say, Paulson or not today, Geithner. If you gave it to the U.S. Treasury, you just put it back on the public debt side. And you, you get it to the, uh, the uh, private side of the uh, Federal Reserve. Yeah, you, or, you, or the Treasury, the private side of the Treasury. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. Which is at, uh, what, how you pronounce his name, Escobedo or? Anna Escobedo Cabral. Right. Anna Escobedo Cabral is the treasurer of the U.S. And Timothy Geithner is the secretary of treasury. And they're both at my bank, which is at 1500 Pennsylvania Avenue. And they are both on the same floor, mailing offices wise, just down the hall from one another. But if you took a Federal Reserve note and looked at it, and you split it in half, and what you're you're seeing is a, is a ledger sheet, because it's the ledger sheet being viewed through on a mirror because it's backwards. Because a regular ledger sheet has the assets on the right and the liabilities on the left, but if you look at it in the mirror, it's going to be backwards, and you're looking at a Federal Reserve note, it's backwards. On the left side, that's where the black seal is, that's where the uh, asset side is, which is backwards. And the right side is where the liability side is, that's where Geithner's got his signature, the green seal. The black seal's Anna Escobedo Cabral, unless she's been changed by a newer appointment, I don't know, could be. But then you have the, the minus side, the liability side on the right, the green seal, that's the public side, the public debt side. On the left side, you have the asset side, the private side, the non-negotiable side. The right side where the liabilities are, the green seal, that's where the uh, negotiable instruments are. So as you see, we've been doing it backwards even by our deposits into the Treasury. You know, Sam, or, or, uh, Christian, I was thinking uh, if we're going to, we're not going to cut the head of the snake off so we have that portal into the public, then probably what we need to become is snake charmers. Well, it says in the scriptures to be wise as a snake and uh, gentle as a dove. So our problem all along is uh, we've been creating negotiable instruments, and we should have been creating non-negotiable instruments, and we need to be putting them on the private side of the bank instead of the public side of the bank. So you can see we've been doing it all wrong. And then we have to keep it separate, because the key to the trust is not to uh, commingle the funds or keep it segregated so that you put an in-kind deposit in, special deposit, and you get an in-kind back out. No changes. No, Nothing's been done to it. You get the very exact same thing back. And if we're not careful, then how we make the deposits, that could be a major flaw right off. So everybody should have this Gilbert's Law Summary book, and it's entitled Trust by Edward C. Halbach, Jr. If you do not have that, the actual book, I, I, I would order it, get that. Uh, anybody that's going to plan on attending a workshop has to have that book. And uh, also UCC with the comments, official comments. You need the UCC with official comments. And you also need a Black's Law Dictionary, at least an 8th edition. I think they've come out with a ninth edition, but you know, anyway, need an 8th edition. The download of this Gilbert's Law does not read the same as my book. So if you're going to follow along, you won't be able to follow along in that download. For some reason, that download does not comport to this book.
there there are some pages missing I found already, and uh, I, I don't know uh, whoever copied that might not have copied it right, or it may be misinformation for the purpose of disinformation. So I I don't know. The best thing to do is get the actual book, the 2008 edition that I'm using, and and to follow along. And I'm going to turn to page nine of the book. In page nine, it's all about debtor. It's all about uh, relationships that we're forming, and we want to particularly key in on to debtor credit relationship and, and that versus trust relationship. And it talks about debtor credit relationship in section 42 on page 9. It says that debt differs from a trust in that although the creditor may have a claim against the debtor personally, the creditor has no interest in a specific property of the debtor, at least until judgment or unless the creditor has a security interest, in which case the rights are still different from those of a trust beneficiary. And the guide to distinguish in it says, notwithstanding some obvious distinction, it is somewhat difficult to tell whether a debt or a trust relationship was intended. So it's difficult to tell whether a debt or a trust relationship was intended in a given situation. The crucial distinction is usually whether the parties intended to create a relationship with respect to the specific property. Well, if the grantor knew what he was doing, it was the law of the trust is really the intent and purpose of the grantor, so but he didn't really have to tell anybody that he was forming a trust. So to give an example here, it says the transfer hands transfer E a bundle of $20 bills totaling $500 and indicates that she wants that money returned at a specific date. And if, as is likely, the transfer does not care whether she gets back the particular group of bills, the particular group of bills, or even property directly traceable to them, the arrangement cannot be a trust, but is simply a debt. Thus, the transferee can repay transferor any $500 and is free to dispose of the particular bills received. That is not a special deposit because there was commingled funds. You didn't request the exact thing that you deposited in back, and that's key to formation of a trust. Because if I tell you I want my pen back and give you my pen, we just formed a trust. And the specific property was the pen, and I wanted that specific property back. That was my intent and my purpose. And there was nothing mentioned about trust terms, nothing about uh, commingling funds or a special deposit or anything like that. None of that verbiage was even in there. But that does not negate the fact that all the elements were there, necessary to form a trust. and one of the four methods of the formation of the trust was there, and the law must recognize that to be a trust. And as long as I didn't intend that the funds were to be commingled or to be they were supposed to be segregated, kept in kind, then we have a valid trust. That's how easy it is. But since we didn't express it to be a trust, they're construing it, of course, on their own bias bent, the way they want it, and they want it under debtor creditor, because under debtor creditor they can get you lock up, say, in a mortgage agreement, secondary unconscionable contract, to pay your mortgage payments for the next thirty years, four times over, the, say, the value of the property, which was really this security interest in the collateral of your house was nothing more than an insurance policy ensuring that they would get payment in case you never expressed the trust at the closing in escrow. Because that's when you should express the trust and told them to take the note that you gave them and apply it into a special deposit. And by special deposit, under Black's Law 4th edition, Black's Law 4th edition says that a trust deposit the trust deposit in Black's fourth it says where money or property is deposited to be kept intact 
and not commingled with other funds or property of bank and is to be returned in kind to depositor, that's one, or two, devoted to a particular purpose, or three, requirement of a depositor, or four, this is the bingo, payment of particular debts or obligations of debtor, and also called special deposit. So a special deposit is also called a trust deposit. And we want to make sure that we make trust deposits or special deposits. Because if we make special deposits, trust deposits, we are making non-negotiable private side transactions. And they're not effectively connected with a US trade or business. So we have been talking about on the show the W8BEN and W8IMY. And on the W8BEN, on the instructions for that, on page 7, now this is under the certification part, part 4. Part 4 starts on page 6, but it continues on page 7. But on page 7, we're talking about broker transactions or barter exchanges, and this is under certification. So broker transactions, those are really trust transactions we're talking about, and barter exchanges, those are really trust exchanges we're talking about. So we're talking about private exchanges on, on the private side. These are private trades, because this is an exchange of trade. And it's the definitions. The definitions, they've conveniently given you several different options under the definitions to comport to whether or not you're under debt or creditor on one side or whether you're under trust on another side. And how they use the definition, they slide it back and forth with a sleight of hand, and you don't know the difference. Because that insurance policy that locked you in the next 30 years to make a payment, that was just an insurance policy. Because they, they figured that you didn't know what was up, and all you had to do at closing was to tell them to make a special deposit and then apply the proceeds from that special deposit to the other side of the ledger and zero the account. And your house would have been paid at that moment. But they said, in case you don't do that, we're going to request that you sign this unconscionable contract and for the next 30 years, you make payments until you finally get your mind in gear and figure out what's going on. And none of us have. So trade, definition of Black's Law, is the business, business of buying and selling or bartering. And there we go, barter exchange. Just on this page 7 of barter exchange on the W8 Ben form. So the business of buying and selling or bartering. Goods and services, commerce. Now that's all public. Co public is commerce. Commerce is public, is UCC, is law merchant. It's all debtor credit relationship. It's all commerce, it's all, it's all trade. And number two definition, a transaction. Well, weren't we talking about broker transactions up here on page seven again? It says a transaction or a swap. Well, isn't a swap an exchange? So we're talking about transactions and exchanges or bartering and swaps. And really, we're talking about broker transactions or barter exchanges on the W-8 Ben on page 7 on the instructions. And this is all certification. And certification is what? If you look on the form itself, what are you certifying? Part 4 in the certification says, under penalties of perjury, I declare. And the only thing that per can declare, make a declaration, is a real man. So that's a private side document. And what's a declaration? Is that one of the methods of formation of a trust? One of the four methods of a trust is declaration, which is your words or your conduct. So 
So right off the bat, they say, under penalties of perjury, declare, under, I declare. Well, so what are you declaring under number one? That I am the beneficial owner or I am authorized to sign for the beneficial owner. So the authorized representative. And two, the beneficial owner is not a U.S. person. U.S. person is public. U.S. person is commerce. U.S. person is U.S. trade or business. And number three, the income from what from this form relates is a not effectively connected with a conduct of trade or business in the United States. So you're making a declaration under penalty of perjury that you're not effectively connected with the United States. But then after you made this declaration and you went out there and you created negotiable debt instruments and tried to negotiate them on the public side, you just contradicted what you said, and now you're in breach of perjury. And they probably throw you in jail for that. Because really, everything in commerce today is fiction, doesn't exist. It's in your mind. That's going to take a concept to figure that out a little bit. But everything in debt or credit or on the public side today in fiction land is not existent. It doesn't exist. It's fiction in your mind. Like Dorothy in The Wizard of Oz. She went all through that movie there. She was in Oz. Looked real, but wasn't. She was dreaming. The tornado hit her in the head, and she was knocked out, unconscious for the rest of the movie. Dreaming. You're all dreaming, folks. So the beneficial owner is not a U.S. person, and the income is not effectively connected with a conduct or trade of business in the United States, and not subject to tax under an income tax treaty. And for, for broker transactions or barter exchanges, the beneficial owner is ex an exempt foreign person. And it says, furthermore, I authorize the form to be provided to any withholding agent who has control, receipt, or custody of the income, and blah, 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 the beneficial owner or any withholding agent that can dis disperse or make payments of the income of which I am the beneficial owner. Then the signature of the beneficial owner or the individual authorized to sign for and then on the right, the capacity in which you are acting. But all through the instructions here, it talks about, you know, OID, interest. Interest, including certain original issue discount or OIDs. And it's interest flowing from the transactions. And now what, what type of transaction? A trust deposit or a debtor creditor deposit as secured transactions on a UCC1 filing. Trust deposit, interest on a trust deposit deriving from a foreign source is non-taxable, whereas on the debtor creditor side, interest derived from the public side is is subject to withholding. Did you get that publication, 515? No, I haven't yet. OK, it's a little hard to, oh, no, that's, that's the other form. Uh, the instructions for the requester of forms W8 series, the W8 Bannon, the WEIMY, uh, if you don't have that, get that. Uh, and the best way to do it is to do an IRS search for catalog number 26698G. 26698G? Yeah, that's the best way to find that. That's okay. the instructions for the requester of the forms. And that's the one we talked about on the show a couple times about the, the substitute W8BEN and the substitute 8IMY. You right. normally yeah, use is, their forms the way they are made out. Is this correct thinking that all interest is in the public? It's just a matter from what source it derived from, which makes it 
taxable or non-taxable? Well, it could be source of, uh, the source is the key, but it could be private uh, interest. As long as it doesn't show up in the public, you could have interest on the private side. Okay. But that, that interest that is on the public side, what is its source? And that's derived from a special deposit on the private side. Yeah, that's what I was going to get into on the publication eight, uh, 515, but since I'm still in the uh, instructions for the requester here on page 4, were the due diligence requirements. Uh, it says, you are responsible for ensuring that all information related to the type of inf income for which the Form W-8 series is submitted to, is completed and appears to be accurate. Now remember, this is the the one who requests the form from you that's applying to them. So you may rely on the information and certifications provided on the form, including the status of the beneficial owner as an individual, corporation, etc., unless you have actual knowledge or reason to know that the information is unreliable or incorrect. Now, how would they know that? They say that, well, you have reason to know that the information is unreliable or incorrect if you have knowledge of relevant facts or statements contained in the withholding certificate now, that would be the W-8 band, say, or other documentation, and other documentation would be other records, or other computer kept or generated records. So other documentation that would cause a reasonable, prudent person in the position of the withholding agent to question the claims made. For example, if you have information in your records that contradicts information provided on the form, you may not rely on the form. So. The first thing we got to do is we got to go back and we got to correct all the other documentation and get us effectively disconnected from a U.S. trade or business. And the master, individual master file is in the IRS. And under the uh, U.S. Attorney's Manual, under 6-4.010, it states in there that basically says that all other agencies must comport to the IRS records. And my next question is, who creates the IRS records? We do. So you have total control of everything. And you have total control to correct all the misconstrued trust declarations that you didn't express. But first, before we start doing any of this, we're going to have to go back and correct the record system. So we cut the head of the snake off or pull the tree out of the ground and we have to mess around with all the little issues of the leaves. So that when we make out these W-8 Ben forms and these W-I-M-Ys stating that we are non-resident aliens or foreign persons that are subject to withholding because we're not U.S. citizens, because U.S. citizens make out tax returns and pay taxes, but non-resident aliens or foreign people are subject to withholding a 30% rate unless they file these W-8 BIN and the W-8 IMYs. But you can't use these forms the way they make them out because they will effectively connect you back in again. So we have to use the substitute forms. And the substitute form is on page 6 of the instructions for the requester of the W-8 series forms. It says substitute form W-8. And it talks about the substitute that you can use. Uh, you may develop and use your own form W-8-BEN and, or W-8-IMY, a substitute form. If its content is subsequently similar to the IRS official form W-8-BEN or W-8-IMY to the extent required by the instructions and it satisfies certain certification requirements. See, because you have to certify that you are not subject to withholding as a foreign non-resident alien or a foreign person. Then it goes down into the content of substitute form, and it talks about the W-8 Ben, and it talks about the form W-8 IMY next. 
And on page seven, the real the real kicker is at the very last where they're quoting this special quote from the IRS. It says uh, the following statement must be presented in the same manner as in the preceding sentence and must appear immediately above the signal uh, single signature line. Quote. The Internal Revenue Service does not require your consent to any provisions of this document other than the certifications required to establish your status. So these two forms, that's all these forms are about. These are certifications required to establish your status. And as long as you don't have any other conflicting information out there and other, any other record keeper, say a bank or a credit reporting system or something, or the DOT, or whatever agency, whatever agency has got to comport to the IRS, and you got to correct the IMF master file first before you go out and attempt to do any of this stuff. Or else your documentation might show up that you've got conflicting information and they will not honor the documentation, and you can't get a payment or an interest and you will be defeated before you start. So, so now this form publication, or excuse me, publication 515. This is like uh, 50 pages long. But you want to pay uh, particular sections to the documentation where it talks about beneficial owner on page 7, and then on page 14 it talks about the income subject to NRA withholding. So NRA is non-resident alien. So if we go to page 14 on that form, it says income subject to NRA withholding. So this section explains how to determine if payment is subject to NRA withholding. A payment is subject to NRA withholding if it is from sources within the United States. So that's that's the key, sources within the United States. And then it goes to the next sec little subsection there. It says amounts not subject to NRA withholding. It says the following amounts are not subject to NRA withholding. And it gives seven bullets here. And I'm going to jump down to the second bullet, which says bank deposit interest. Special deposits. Trust deposits. That's what I'm talking about. That's what it's talking about bank deposit interest that is not effectively connected with the conduct of a U.S. trade or business. And it says see interest later. And that later is on page 18. And I'm jumping down to the uh, sixth bullet, which says original issue discount paid on the sale of an obligation other than redemption. Now the next major heading is source of income. So now this this payment that is not subject to withholding its source of income payment or interest because they have three three things in this section here they're talking about income they're talking about payment they're talking about interest and the source of that income the source of that payment the source of that interest the first paragraph talks about income and about midway it talks about payments the source of the income and the payment. The next paragraph starts out says generally interest now. Interest on an obligation of foreign corporation or foreign partnership is foreign source income. If the entity is engaged in a trade or business in the United States during its tax year, interest paid by such an entity is treated as from U.S. sources only if, only if, the interest is paid by a U.S. trade or business conducted by an entity or is allocable to income that is treated as effectively connected with the conduct of a U.S. trade or business. So you might be asking, okay, how do we prove that? Well, that's the certification on the W-8-BEN and the w 8 I am why, as long as there's no other conflicting information to say otherwise. So we're talking about bank deposit interest or special deposit interest. Interest on my special deposits. 
So page 15, it says activities outside the United States under scholarship, fellowships, and grants. It says those made by entities created or domiciled in a foreign country are treated as income from foreign sources. So see, our private non-negotiable instruments are from foreign sources. And its next section is activities outside the United States. A scholarship, a fellowship, or a grant. Where do you get a grant from? <laughs> from a grantor? <laughs> it says received by a non-resident alien for activities conducted outside the United States is treated as foreign source income. So now next section at the bottom, page 15, says withholding on specific income. Withholding on specific income. Because really all non-resident aliens or foreign persons are subject to withholding on the 30% rate unless, unless they give the certification. So page 16 now, it says FDAP income may or may not be effectively connected with the U.S. business. In the next section, it says income from securities. So if a foreign person's U.S. office actively and materially participates in soliciting, negotiating, or performing other activities required to arrange the acquisition of the securities, the U.S. source interest the U.S. source interest or dividend income from the securities gain or loss from this, their sale or exchange, remember the W-8 Ben talking about the bar barter exchanges and transactions, broker exchanges. So their sale or exchange or income or gain economically equivalent to such amounts is attributable to the U.S. office and is effectively connected income. So you got to have a broker involved. Because unless you don't, if you have a broker, you're not materially participating in soliciting or negotiating or performing other activities required to arrange the acquisition, the U.S. source interest. Must have a broker. Next section is notional principal contract income, which is payment of an amount attributable to the notional principal contract is not subject to NRA withholding regardless of whether a form W-8-ECI is provided. So down a little farther it says you do not need to treat notional principal contract income as effectively connected if, the if you receive a form W-8-BEN that represents The income is not effectively connected with the conduct of a U.S. trade or business, or if the payee provides a representation, representation in a master agreement, or the confirmation of the particular notional principal contract transaction that the payee or the U.S. person or non-U.S. person branch or foreign person. Master agreement. So we go to the back off, bank officer's handbook of commercial banking law, sixth edition here, and we turn to page uh, section 19.02. And we talk about special deposits under C. It says special deposits are created by contract. A special contract between the bank and the depositor. Now I want to jump down to D, which talks about certificates of deposit. It says these certificates may be either negotiable, which are public, all negotiable instruments are public, or non-negotiable, all non-negotiable instruments are private. When non-negotiable, the bank simply contracts, contracts to return the amount to the depositor plus any contracted for interest. Here comes interest again. Contracts. Then we jump to section three where it says opening an account. 
Opening an account in a bank involves only a simple contract. There it is, a contract again. In which the depositor lends money to the bank. All right, who's the lender here? Did you know you're the lender? You're the bank? Remember, this is under the opening an account. Opening an account in a bank involves only a simple contract in which the depositor lends money to the bank. All along, the depositor has been the lender, not the bank. In return for an agreement, there's that contract again, by the bank to pay back the amount either with or without interest. There's that interest again. So back to your notional principal contracts, which is line 11 on the Ben form. So these are master agreements. These are master agreements for interest on your special deposits. So next section is the, on publication 515, is the income not effectively connected. And under that section it talks about interest then. Interest from U.S. sources paid to foreign payee is subject to NRA withholding. Down a little farther says even if their payment or a portion of the payment may be return of capital rather than interest. The next section under that talks about OIDs. It says the original issue discount paid as part of the purchase price of the obligation sold or exchanged other than in redemption is not subject to NRA withholding. So a sale or an exchange is not subject to an NRA withholding on an OID. Then we're going to skip page 17, although you might want to look at dematerialized book entry systems. And we want to jump to page 18 where the bingo is. The bingo on page 18 is interest on deposits, which is income code 29 on the 1042-S form. It says a foreign person are not subject to withholding on interest that is not connected with a U.S. trade or business if it is from, and there's three bullets. First bullet is deposits with persons carrying on banking business. And then we establish the fact that on, under opening accounts that you are a bank. So you fall under this classification of deposits with persons carrying on banking business. And you're doing business and banking every day. You're a bank every day. Next bullet is deposits or withdrawable accounts with savings institutions chartered under federal or state law or similar associations. Now, those could be the brokers on those that do the transactions and the barter exchanges. And now the next paragraph. Deposits include certificates of deposits which I read from the bankers, uh, bank officer's handbook, was talking about the CDs, the certificates of deposits that bear interest. So the deposits include certificates of deposits, open account time deposits, and other deposit arrangements. Well, how about your notional principal contracts? Or your trust or your special deposits, your, your private non-negotiable transactions. So the deposit interest exception does not require Form W-8-BEN and blah, blah, blah. And you do not have to file Form 1042-S to report certain payments of interest on deposits, it says. So the key is to keep your private instruments private and your public instru instruments, your uh, excuse me, public in uh, interest, keep it public. So let's say I have a straw man entity 
or maybe an LLC that's in the public, because a straw man is a public entity, and an LLC would be a public entity, so that's on a public side. But what is its source of its income that it's doing purchases of goods and service that are being consumed by the real man on the private? If its source of income, like in the publication 515, was from private sources and is traceable back to a foreign entity, a foreign person, that was not subject to withholding by certification on the BIN and IMY forms, and with no other conflicting instruments that negates that, then you have a foreign source income that's not subject to withholding and not taxable. And as long as it's flowing through from one direction and never goes back the other way, then it's not commingling. So this entity would solely be for the purpose of purchases of goods and services, and its source of income was solely on the private side, although it was a public-sided entity. So there's like a membrane separating the public side from the private side, and neither one goes back and forth. It must stay on its own side. Because if it did, it would be commingled. And as soon as you commingle it, you got problems, major problems. So now the key comes to when I effectively jump off this economic slave debtor credit relationship that's sucking all my assets from me. When I effectively jump off, I don't ever want to jump back on. And I don't ever have to work a day in my life again for Federal Reserve notes. Because I can generate as much private credit or private negotiable debt instruments as I want. And I'm not even talking about the assets that were taken in 1933, which is the real gold and silver. I'm not even talking about that. I'm not talking about that $35 billion plus still waiting in the account for me, that they're probably going to trick me to give, them, give me gold certificates, which are nothing more than public-sided IOUs, but if they did that, they'd be in breach of fiduciary duty, breach of trust, because that would be the proof that they co-mingled the funds on the special deposit back in 1933. And I don't think they'd want to do that with me. Because I put gold in, I want gold out. Unless we got some kind of other agreement. And we're not even talking about paper figure money. You see, House Joint Resolution was created back in 1933 as a pressure relief valve as the pressure, the upward pressure of the velocity of the money increased, which was necessity for whatever crisis came into existence, they came up with a system that they could create as much money as they wanted just by the signatures of the real man. But then once the crisis has passed, they were supposed to discharge that pressure by the set-off, releasing the pressure back down to normal because we didn't need it anymore. As long as things remained in balance, everything would work fine. But you see, they've been blocking a remedy only because we didn't know it was all about trust. And since we didn't know it was about trust, we got sucked into our debtor creditor, a total fiction land, where there is nothing that's truth, it's all lies, it doesn't exist, it's fiction. There is no debt. And the debt that you create in fiction land can't pay another debt in fiction land. It just adds up more debt. We become bigger debtors. So here it was all about trust. We never knew it because all we had to do was express the trust at the beginning and your mortgage would have been paid and all your other debts could have been paid also. Now, I'm not going to get into the bingo that I'm going to talk about tomorrow night on the next show, which is the reason why you can't get a remedy today. So stay tuned for that one tomorrow at 10 p.m.
So have we got any questions so far? Or have I totally lost everyone? Anybody out there have a question? Say something, press star six. Hello? Yes. Who's this? Hi, Christian is Cynthia in Chicago. How's it going? Hey, you mentioned about that um uh, I'm sorry, so I'm trying to call uh catalog two six six nine eight G. Right. Um, I just tried to look that up. Um that's on the IRS website, correct? Correct. Yeah, I, I was looking that up and it wouldn't come up. Is that under a specific um, well, if you publication go, or just catalog, period? Well, if you go to the IRS forms where you request forms and you punch in the number and stuff, if you do the general search and you search for just, uh, uh, they have it, let's see, C-A-T period, or I don't think it takes a period, but just put in there C-A-T and then N-O for number, catalog number, and then put that number in. Okay. okay. And as in go, not it's G as in go two six six nine eight G. Okay, okay. I thought you said D, didn't you? D as no. a dog. No, I have, I said G. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Christian. What was the name of the book that you were reading from um, when when you read the section three with opening the account? All right, that's the Bank Officer's Handbook of Commercial Banking Law. Bank Handbook. You're going to have to go to a law library to get that. That's by um, Schroeder, S-C-H-R-O-E-D-E-R. -E -E and I read from the sixth edition. Okay. I have the uh, 1962 version, I have the 1982 version, and I have another version. Christian, you mentioned the um, IMS file um, with the IRS. Um, how would you suggest going about starting to uh, to clean that up and to correct uh, the status, your current status that you have in the IMS file? Well, we have two forms, W-8-BEN and W-8-IMY, that need to be you know studied in depth along with publication 515, until you know it like the back of your hand. Because mm -hmm. the, the attorney's manual, U.S. attorney's manual, you can go look this up, 6-4.010. Just type in USAM. Just do a Google search for USAM, 6-4.010, and read that section. It, but it basically says that all other agencies, like Department of Justice, all other agencies must comport to the IRS records. Because the, the whole system was created for uh, uniformity and record keeping. And the standard is the IRS. But you're the, ones who, you're the one who puts any information, or don't, doesn't put any information in, because when they put in false information in it, you don't correct it. You don't check it out and see what's in there. And when you don't... Uh, object to it, then you consent to it. So they got this straw man down as all kind of effectively connected with a business or trade in the United States for doing gun running, doing narcotics transactions and everything else. And you'd be surprised at the amount of money that's running through that account unknown to yourself. But yet all this needs to be corrected that you are not the surety for that entity. And through these forms, you can do the certification and then effectively just join yourself from that. You're going to do that with the commissioner of the IRS. And you have to be aware of what's in the file itself. You can't just do um, a blanketed... Um, well, I, I really don't care what's in that master file. I just want to be disconnected from it for me yeah. being the, the, the trustee on that account. Mm -hmm. Well, 
But once I get connected, then I don't want to go back in by my actions and act accordingly by commingling funds and getting me trapped back in and creating some new evidence that says otherwise. And what they do basically is they just wait another 30, 60, 90, 120 days on an international to see whether or not you will trip up and do what you've done in the past. Mm -hmm. And when you do, they don't honor any of these things then. They don't have to. Christian, I got a question for you about that. Go ahead, Mike. Okay. Um, can we have a common law trust that we put the straw man in and let him do the commerce and that could keep us squeaky clean? That way we could, you know, uh, have money. In the uh, you know, how, how can you have a common law trust which is in a private and have a straw man which is in the public? Right off the bat there, you commingled. Okay. That's, that's Kind of my question: Could that be done? Because without a doubt, we've got to quit the commingling, and that's what we're doing. You know, I mean, like I've got a bank, you know, account, and I'm drawing interest off of it. So if I went in and tried to st straighten my status up, I'm, I'm commingling, you know, within 30 days. So they've got. Okay. Well, the interest you couldn't touch the interest generated from that straw man account, say. Because if you touched it and spent it, and you sell back in, yeah. See, it's like you have to separate yourself out first, and and then you have to make a special deposit on the private side, and get a special agreement through the notional contracts on the public side, and get a public side broker involved into making the transaction work for you to start generating interest that can be put into an LLC on the public side or your straw man account on the public side, and those funds and those funds alone or what you use to purchase your everyday consumers and service goods that you need to live in existence. Yeah. Well, you brought up the, the word earlier, you know, a broker for us, and that sounded really good when you said that. Well, it says on that uh, instructions for the request of the forms that in there that, you know, if you didn't, you were the one who would be pursuing the transaction and the advertising and doing the selling and all that, and that is going to get you back into the transaction. So the broker is acting like an independent, a qualified intermediary or maybe a non-qualified intermediary, uh, probably qualified. But anyway, he, as long as you have the W8Ben and the IMYs that certifies that you're not and you didn't do any of the actions that the broker would be doing, then you're not effectively tying yourself back in. And you're staying on the private side. So what would be commingling? So let's say I set up a separate entity, an LLC, say the ABC Corporation or something, and that is drawn against uh, the interest that I'm going to generate is going to be drawn against my private source, and the interest is going to be my income that I'm going to live off the rest of my life. So let's say I want to take an, uh, out of that LLC. I go out and I, go, I buy a, a, an apartment building. And I start generating rents and incomes from that. And what I did is I just commingled funds again because I did a business. I did a business for profit and, and gain, and I just wrecked my LLC and commingled the funds. Now, if I wanted to maybe do a separate business, I would have to set up an entity all by itself, separate. And that entity would be a separate entity that it solely would be liable for taxes on the profits that it generated because the generated source would be United States trader business. I could do that. Okay. Would it need a corporation ID? Yes, it would. Because it would be that's a public what, side entity. That's what, would, that's what would keep it over on the public side and at arm's length. Yes, you never want to apply as a real man on any of these forms for an EIN, an ITN, or a TN. You want no number whatsoever because the minute you apply for a number, you just cross yourself right back into the same thing you're trying to get out from. The real man does not have a number. Or driver's license? Yes, right. So all of these benefits we've got to back out of. Well, now they can be separate entities, 
Remember, the corp the straw man is a separate entity. He can have a driver's license. Okay, okay. Well, we just got to be able to set it up separate and operate like that. Yes, but did you give them a W-8 Ben that said you were foreign when you gave the driver's license? And how did you give the signature? Did you put a qualifier with it? Did you specify that you were a grantor or a beneficiary or an authorized representative? Remember the certification. The answer, to that, the answer to that is no, but in the future I must do that. Yes, or else you connect yourself right back in again. And it's very easy to trip up and get connected back in again, okay. unless you are particularly paying attention to everything that you are signing. Because from that okay. point on, you must give a restricted or a qualified signature. Okay, I got one more question for you, then, and then I'll jump off, Christian. I got a lot of friends that's wanting me to do the paperwork to become a secured party creditor. You know, I keep holding it off saying, you know, I don't think I need to. Um, now, I don't want to become a secured party creditor directly. I got to set up trust first. Okay. Because one of the reasons why they're pushing me to hurry up and do it is they feel like that the Social Security Trust Fund, if you don't make a claim on it now, that in the next few months, that it's going to be fixed where you can't make a claim. Anything like that? That's BS. Okay. You mean to tell me that if I loaned you something and uh, what they're going by is statutory law and they're saying, well, the statute of limitations is going to leave, you know. But if it was done in fraud. But here's one of the things that the talk, okay, I don't know this, but it's the talk. One of the reasons why Obama went to Copenhagen is he's putting the birth certificates on uh, worldwide market, pulling it from just the United States market to the to the worldwide market, they get access to it. Well, that that's fine, uh, but he still owes me. Okay. <laughs> you, you see where they're kind of, uh, it's, it's, they're thinking something sneaky could be going on is what they're thinking, okay? Well, really, the sneaky thing is that we don't know what's going on. I want to hurry up and make a claim on this so I can hold my birth certificate trust account. Well, I've been thinking that, you know, we really don't need to terminate that trust. I, I really want to use it. Why, sh why should I go in there and terminate something that's working fine? It's already been set up. It's already been funded. I just have to learn how to use it. That's my thoughts. So, you know, that there's more than enough there. And so uh, since it's trading on the open market right now, I don't want to pull it in. I just want to keep on doing that and keep everybody happy. Because, you know, counties and things have probably bought into it, these municipals. Yeah, but what have they bought into? The public side debt, which is the bonds running and floating in the pools, drawn off the asset held in private? The private funds are still there. Whatever they want to do with their public funds, that's fine with me. I still have access to the private funds, and nothing is ever going to change that. Well, I feel a lot better now, Christian. You said that straight. Thank you. You know, the fact that they took the gold in 1933, they owe me. They owe all of you. And just because time goes by, say, 100 years, that doesn't negate the fact that there's still a debt owed. I haven't discharged them from any debt obligation, although we probably might be able to by their public statutes and codes and things. But then again, that's all fiction land. And I don't really have to operate in fiction land. If I understand what's really going down and what, what is really happening, then I can use both sides to my own advantage. And then I'm in control of both sides of the ledger. I got control of the public side. I got control of the private side. And really, we all do. We've had it all along. We just never knew it. Just like Dorothy in The Wizard of Oz, the first thing when she entered into Oz, the good witch granted her the magic slippers with all the power to get back home. She had it from the very start. And she went all through that movie and finally to the end, finally came to the realization that she had that power all along, but the witch said, you know, you would have never believed me if I told you. You had to go through all this to figure it all out. 
All you have to do is click your heels together three times, and those three clicks are right, title, and interest. And right, title, and interest is trust. But you see, she wasn't trusting the witch. We need to start operating in trust. Because that's where our remedy is under right, title, and interest. The remedy is in trust not in debtor-credit relationship, not directly. Now, I might want to choose later on to go into debtor-credit relationship after I establish standing as grantor in trust because that's really the only way I'm going to get access to the colorable titles which represents the goods and services that I want that are really in the real substance and the private. But i got to have the colorable titles to access them, to legally be able to be holding or use them, So we have to learn this public-private flip-flop, which is really nothing more than a ledger sheet. Assets on one side, liabilities on the other. And we're not trained to think multidimensionally, and that's part of the problem. Because we have a multidimensional world, because in 1933, because they took out the lawful money, a trust ran in to fill the void, and a trust immediately split the title. Split the perfected title in half. And they have one half went to the legal title held in the trustee, and the other one went to the beneficial title held in the beneficiary. The nine-tenths of the law possession title in the trustee, the legal title, and the one-tenth representing the real beneficial interest in the beneficiary. So they threw in another monkey wrench. We got a, a, another split here. Not, so we got to think in another another flip flop, and we got to learn how to speak a foreign language. That foreign language is really Black's Law, where they use all these portal terms like transfer, which means. Uh, under trust could be a method of formation or transfer could be UCC, a negotiation of a negotiable debt instrument on a public side where the trust transfer was forming a, debt, a trust which was private. But keep in mind that this Gilbert Law Summary's book is really uh, a statutory trust that we're talking about here. And it's a good primer, but it's really not the real trust I've been talking about, which is a private trust. And that master trust, that master private trust, is the Declaration of Independence, which all other sub-trusts in the public are drawn against. So we have another question. Um, Christian, could you go over that broker uh, position again? Um, I missed where you were... Um uh, getting that resource from. Okay, that's in the W-8 Ben form on the instructions on page 7. Okay. And you want to check out the uh, publication 515. It's also uh, s similar information in there that you want to check on also. Okay. Yeah, the, the W-8 Ben and the W-8 IMY, the instructions, the forms, uh, the instructions for the request of the forms, W-8-BEN, and the uh, publication 515. Uh, you want to read all of that word for word. Okay. And it gets to, it gets to be a little in-depth study because you really should be checking some of the things they make reference to in those publications and things, too. So it gets to be involved, but uh, the... The key to not commingling is in the administration of the trust. And how you administer the trust is going to be with the knowledge of the IRS forms. So you got to know the IRS forms. Okay, another question. Anybody else have a question? So if you know a broker, so a broker is kind of basically a a portal, a way to, to operate. He's handling things, not you, to go from the private to the public. Is that right? 
Uh, I'm going to say that the broker is going to be doing certain things that you shouldn't be doing, or else you're going to be connecting yourself back in. And that would be the sole purpose of that. And he's probably going to have more connections that you do to start out with that he's going to know where to get the source of the interest from. So if I know I have I know a broker and he could be of use to me. Uh it depends. Uh there, there is what they call a G13, and the G13 is not the nations of the 13. This is the G13. These are 13 brokers set up all throughout the world that handle all transactions for the IMF and the World Bank. So these are special brokers that do these broker trades that are usually set up for 40-week transactions that generate on a weekly basis equal to the sum amount that you have in our special deposit on a weekly basis. And they run for 40-week trades. This wouldn't be, this would be different, Christian, from a paymaster? A uh, paymaster. I'm not familiar with that term. Paymaster, well, how do you mean? Well, uh as far as my information is, the paymasters, they are, they are attorneys that handle, um, um, this, this broker has a special license to do this, kind, these kind of transactions. Okay. Maybe the paymaster has that special license, uh, maybe he doesn't. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, well, they expect you to know, um, pretty much, you know, you have to know what you're talking about if you come to them or they won't deal with you. So I just assume that that's probably this position. But they're the ones that get um, a lot of things done. All right. Well, how are they, what are they associated with? All I know is that they're um, a higher echelon of uh, attorneys. Um, I'm actually um, set up to speak with one at the end of this week. Are they tied in with uh, private banks? Yes. So most most banks have a private side, which are you know what we're talking about, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which is nothing more than back office banking. Exactly. That's what we're talking about. We're talking about special handling and special handling of uh, special items or, or non cash items, and non cash items are really non negotiable in uh, yeah non negotiable instruments. They're private instruments, and they're not put through like the front window. And the transaction is done like you would cash a normal check. Right. Exactly. And it's so crazy how I found out about it. Is, um, a woman who did work in the bank, and she had no idea that. Uh, well, actually, this this office actually had the the Department of Treasury. Um, this back office was. Well, all and transactions she, through Treasury are really done through the TTL account. Yeah. Well, she had no idea. She never put two and two together that it was actually operating separately from what she was doing, you know, up front. Mm -hmm. So it was kind of interesting. During my conversation, I realized that uh, with her. Hey, Christian? Yes. Would a uh, would the U.S. Treasurer be a special broker? He could handle the transaction. I really don't want to talk a whole lot about that just yet because it's kind of a little premature, but yeah, that's the direction we're going. But it depends whether or not you're talking to the Secretary of Treasury or whether you're talking to the Treasurer of the United States. I'm talking about the Treasurer of the United States on the private side. Yeah, and Escobedo Cabral. Yeah. Yeah. Now she might pass it through on the public side and give the instructions to Geithner to do the interest trade. But if it was drawn against a special deposit that I put in with Escobedo Cabral, now we have foreign source income. Interest is generated against foreign source. Anybody else have a question? Dave, are you out there? 
Yeah, I see uh, David on there, but I don't know if he can hear us or not. He's usually got some questions. <laughs> David, are you out there? Press star six. Oh, uh, thank you. That was what it was. So, yeah, my question is um, about, because uh, I came in late on the call, I was, um, I'm unclear as to what is the relationship between my uh, human being and the uh, corporate fiction or the trust. Am I the grantor trustee or the grantor beneficiary or both in some way? Well, what is that relationship? Uh, the real person, you mean? The uh, Yeah. Yeah, he's grantor beneficiary for sure. And who is the trustee? Uh, the trustee is, what's his name, Geithner. Okay. okay. Uh, basically, it's the United States. The United States is a trustee. In, in 1933, when they took the gold, that went into the trust. And Geithner, whoever is that, in that office, Secretary of Treasury, he's, he's the trustee of the whole thing. Now, he may have assigned it to someone else, whoever his successor is. And I assume that you have taken great pains to describe um, uh, this whole relationship and what to do, what's the best way to function uh, within that relationship. But I have come into the conversation late, and I was wondering if there's anything written or recorded calls or something that I could listen or read um, and catch up. Uh, this is the first call on this topic, and we're going to go from there. Oh, okay. Uh, so if I am the grantor beneficiary and Geithner is the trustee, then how do I get Geithner to 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 uh, do what is to the greatest beneficiary benefit of the beneficiary? Okay, but what I want to do is I want to put things in special deposits, and the assets that I put in special deposit, then a broker is going to be the one who's going to set up the transaction, or one that he may appoint. Let's put it that way. Which sounds kind of complicated to me. Is is it necessary to have a broker? Is there a simpler way of doing it? No, you have to have a broker because on that publication that I said that the uh, W A P E N. Uh, that was on the instructions for the uh, requester of the forms. Let's see, where's it at here? There are those that say you simply can accept things for value and have them discharged. Debtor creditor. The IRS. That's not trust. Pardon? That's debtor creditor. That's not trust. That's public. You're putting yourself right back in. I see. And what is the harm with, with doing that? Uh, you're not going to get a remedy. They're, they're only giving you what they're, what they're giving you. And they're just giving us a little dog bone here and there. And that dog bone is to mislead us and keep us on the trail, which is the wrong path. So the acceptance for value is just piddly peanuts, and there's uh, the real uh, pot of gold is on a different rainbow, you see. Yes. So what is the qualification of this broker? Can we just be brokers for each other, or does one have to... No, you cannot. I'm looking for the section here. Let me see if I can find it. Uh, maybe it was in the publication. And then, why would we want to trust a broker? I mean, who's, who do, do they have to go to four years of college to become a broker, or what? Well, he has the license to do the transactions on the public side to generate the interest that is effectively drawn against the private side. Okay. And then, how much money does that put at one's disposal? As much as you want. Okay. There's no limit. So, how many is there? Is there one of these brokers in every town? Do they do they have shingles? No, there's only eighteen that are the actual. You know, there's only thirteen of them. You know, all, all these transactions, I guess, way I understand it, have to go through one of these thirteen. So, why would one of them talk to me? Because you know who you are as grantor. So they are required by law to talk to me. Otherwise, they'd be in breach of trust. Okay. 
So how do I get their attention? Well, you have to know how to speak the language. And it has to come down to knowing that you're who you are, and you're knowing who you are, by that you know you're the grantor. You're the 900-pound gorilla. Okay. So if they don't talk to me, then what recourse do I have? Well, then I can tell them, you know, we got problems because you won't. We got breach of trust. We got breach of fiduciary duty. So there's these 13 guys in the world or the country, I wasn't clear which, that have to talk with millions and millions of people. No, they don't talk with millions and millions of people. Well, theoretically, they could. I mean, if, if we all learn how to do this. Because it's all like on a tiered basis. they got a, a layer under them that they work with so many people under them. And then there's layers under them and under them, you know, and it, it works on a tier system. Right. So I've got to find some kind of brick in that pyramid that's going to talk to me and relate through the tip. Yes, right. It's under the... Uh, on page 16 of the publication of 515, it's talking about the withholding on specific income, and it's under the subsection uh, effectively connected income and income from securities. And the second paragraph says, if the foreign person's U.S. office actively or materially participates in soliciting, negotiating, or performing or other activities required to arrange the acquisition, the U.S source interest is attributable to the U.S. office as and is effectively connected to income then. So the broker is connected because he is the solicitor, the negotiator. He's performing the activities required to arrange the acquisition. But you can't be. You can't do the transaction. Okay. Like is, so is there, uh, there, are there classes somewhere that I can take to learn how to do this? There are no classes. <laughs> well, there are no. <laughs> it's it's all in the forms and the documentation. It's all there for anybody to dig out, except they yeah, look at it. Understand the language. I mean, what you just read now is so obscure. I mean, you'd have to have some real background and learn it. So I'm sure that people in the Bush family or the Rockefeller family or those such families um, have classes that they take. People teach them how to do these things. Well, when you find some, let us know. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so you're just weaving this or wheedling this out by 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 entering forms. I mean, that's a certain type of knowledge that I'm not. I'm not sure that I could read that sentence you just read. Read. I'm not sure that I could read that and understand what it meant until you explained it to me. That's why I asked. Well, I need a class in this because once you tell me what it means, then I can get it. I can see the picture. Right. But before that, it's just some words on a page that, you know, I, I, I don't know what that means. Yeah, you almost have to know debtor-credit relationships starting out in order to get to this position because now you've got a basis of understanding and you can sort through the weeds. You can separate the chaff from the, the wheat. Yeah, and there's a whole lot of chaff. Yeah, there is because the, the forms are made to design to get you trapped right back in so you can't get out. It's like a minefield, but every minefield has a secret path that you can traverse through if you knew what it was. Right. right. You need someone to explain it to you. So have you been able to properly exercise this yet and get your access to your funds? Well, let's put it this way. I haven't done it yet, but I can see the path. Okay. And I've been saying that, you know, what we've done in the past has been totally, totally, 100% all wrong. All the debtor-creditor stuff that we've been doing, the set-off and all that, is all under debtor-creditor. It's all fiction land. It's all Oz, and it's not the way to go. It's still public debt. And all we've been doing is creating bigger debtors and doing a set-off with debt upon debt, and that just leads to more double debt. And all of it was discretionary. They were granting us any dog bones of success that we had. I don't know if anybody has had a consistent rate of successes in this on de debt or creditor. But I see where trust is a whole different realm. Trust operates solely in equity, and equity is on the private side of the court, and that's where the real substantive rights are of the real man. 
It's all in equity. The remedy is not in debtor-credit relationship as secured party creditor. The remedy is in trust. It's through commerce, through trust and equity. And knowing, not, knowing who you are is not as, as creditor or having standing as creditor. It's going through trust first, establishing your standing in trust. Because when we didn't express the trust, and everything was a trust, when we didn't express the trust, we dropped the ball and they had to pick it up and do something with us, and they're just waiting for us to give them the instructions, and we never give them the instructions. That allows them to construe it and do anything that they want under the construment. But we need a special broker in order to, uh, in order to express the trust, you say? No, not a broker, no. Not, not for that. So it's just a matter of filing the documents to tell them what we want to do, but we still need a broker. Yeah, the broker has to actually do the grunt work, uh, and he's the one who's got the connections, too. Right, so if I send him the appropriate letter, then he's going to uh, set up an account that I can write checks against or something of that nature. Uh, we've already approached a broker, and the broker gave him the appropriate numbers and things, and he said, okay, basically, if you come back with the right documentation, your transaction's done. Oh, sweet. Okay. So how many people can that broker handle? Probably as many as want to do it. Okay. So... How do I, how do I get involved? How do I deal with it? How do how do I do it? Well, it's kind of like you know handing the 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 keys to a thirteen year old of the Ferrari. How long is it going to take the thirteen year old to wreck the Ferrari? <laughs> you know, once you affect, is connected, how long is it going to take you to get reconnected again? Because you don't understand relationships that you're forming, and every signature that you give is getting you into, into uh, the same problem again. So is this having to do with every signature? This isn't like if I sign a check, it's not the same thing. I have to wait. Uh, because every check has, you know, in the micro uh, print, it's authorized representative. No, the question comes Only down to the check that you're signing. What is the sole source of the funds that you're writing the check from? Is it private-sided, non-negotiable? Yeah, private site. Uh, NDIs, or is it off the public side, which is debt? I see. I see. So how would I know the difference, I guess, would be the question. Well, you have to, like, your mind has to be, you know, opened up to, uh, based on the knowledge that you're going to gain through studying. Right. So I'm assuming that anything that I write a check against in, against the bank here, is debt, and it's so it's public side. Yes, because it's probably been effectively connected already with a U.S. source of income or payment or interest already, which is debt, and it's drawn against debt, and therefore it is for debt. Right. So in that regard, you're saying that I should be signing everything as grant or trustee rather than authorized representative. Or does it not make any difference? Uh, well, authorized representative is another one of those portal terms which can be debtor-creditor UCC or can also be trust. Depends on the context and the wording and how you set up the, the contract, so to speak. But really, it comes down okay. to... It's, it, it is simple in a way because it's public and private. That's as simple as it gets. It's either black or it's white. And what you need to do is learn the model first, and then we'll get more into the complexities of the practical application of the, of the, the doctrine. Okay. Well, it seems to me trust is pretty simple. There's a, there's a grantor, there's a trustee, and there's a beneficiary. And the grantor can be a trustee or a beneficiary, but a grantor cannot be both. Correct. So if I'm the grantor and the beneficiary, and 
the United States Corp is the trustee, then I have to somehow give instructions to the trustee or I have to somehow uh, demand that the trustee uh, make the funds or the benefits available to him. If he's the, if he's the broker, yes. So then this broker is going to operate on behalf of... But one other thing, is, it's not that the private funds are accessible to you in the public. They never cross over into the public. Okay, so there's a good question, though. If be, I am a grantor of a trust, then is this trust that I'm a grantor of, it seems to me that would be a private matter. So the trust itself should be private, is it not? Yes, yep, you hit it right on the head there. Then where does it come? Where does it become public? It doesn't, and it never better not. Because if it does, you just commingled, and now you're back under debt or creditor, and you got major problems. Right. So how does it become public? How, how does it? What what would I have to do to make it become public? Well, if you make your non-negotiable instruments anyway public, you just made them negotiable instruments. You just crossed them from the private to the public. So all these negotiable instruments we've been trying to put into the treasury, we're thinking these are private. No, they weren't private. They were all public. We all made them like public. The, you mean such as the, the birth certificate is a public document? Uh, yeah, that is a public document to start out with. So if I put that into the treasury, then it is um, then it's making it public. It always was public. All right. Okay. So it's so then so how does that? So it has nothing to do with what you're describing. It has nothing to do with this particular trust. No, it has to do with special deposit. Special deposits. Special deposit, Sorry, yeah. synonymous with the word trust deposit, which are non-commingable funds that are kept segregated and never cross over. Okay. Well, it seems to me that, that if the trust is indicated by the birth certificate, because the, the trust was created because my mother signed a birth certificate or, or an application that's for the public birth certificate. side of the trust, or that's right. the public that's semblance of the trust. It's not the private trust. It's the colorable title on the public side representing the private trust held in the private. It's a colorable title. It doesn't exist. It's fiction. Yeah, but Does it that gives help? a name, and it gives a name to it. It gives it something to describe it by. Is that correct? Right, you know, some that, way of claiming it, or some way of moving the title from one account to another. All right. So what? Then, so there, then is there a separate one, a trust that the birth certificate creates, another one that the social security number creates, or is that the same? Yeah, trust? That the foreign status or the birth certificate is like a spillover trust, and the SESTA K is social security number. At eighteen, it's spilled over. Okay. But there are colorable titles representing the real thing held in the in the in the private. Okay. Because the so, a trust is a beneficiary trust drawn against the beneficiary is a beneficiary of a trust. So it's a beneficiary trust. That's what that's the K means. That means that the foreign situs trust is get drawn against that. And that foreign situs trust is another colorable title that's representing the birth certificate is the colorable trust title that represents the real assets held in in the in the private. But it doesn't gain you access to it to cross it over into the public from the private. Because if it did, you just made it public. So the trick is to make it so that it's non-commingable, so that the private stays private, the public stays public, and neither one of them cross over. And that's done by special deposit. Well, if if all of the funds, like if I go out and work, and someone gives me some money, they're going to give me Federal Reserve notes, or they're going to give me a check. Right, which is public. That is both of those are public debt. funds. Those are public funds. That's debt. Yes. So how do I put the funds into this trust that isn't that is not public funds? All right, you take a private instrument, say a money order, and you put it into special deposit. And it sits so that's just something I could create. 
I mean, it's just something I just write on a piece of toilet paper and, uh, and, 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 and laminate it so it doesn't deteriorate. And then that's my document, and I just deposit that, and someone's supposed to uh, create currency off of that. Is that correct? No, we do not create currency off of that. That's commingling. Okay. So uh, that's where I'm having difficulty as well. I know. It's, it's my, the out-of-the-box thinking that everybody's still got in-the-box thinking. Yeah, so there's two things here that, that I'm trying to get my head around. One is the flow chart of the trust. There's a birth certificate trust that's somehow created. Yeah, but you're, what you're doing is you're trying to take debtor creditor stuff that your mind has been brainwashed with, and you're trying to apply it to trust. And you're combing you're right there. The birth certificate is irrelevant in this scenario. Yes, right. Okay. And then what is relevant? Simply the uh, what? Then what trust um, do you are you saying that you non non negotiable at? instruments placed into special deposit or trust deposit? Non negotiable instrument trade. So is this a trust that you are now creating, or is this the same trust of which you are? are which uh, same, uh, trust. The, uh, secret same trust? Same trust. Same trust out there on the private side. But I don't have to go okay. through the birth certificate because that's public. And if I do, I'm going to make it public again. Okay. So you want to keep the birth certificate in the vault? Well, I'm not using a birth certificate at all. Right. That's just a colorable title. Okay. A, a trick for you to come through that door. When I come through that door, I just made everything that goes through that door public. All right. So Going through a different door. I'm so then how do I create a uh, non-negotiable instrument that charges that account? And why is that account not already charged? Well, you want to create uh, an instrument so like a money order, and you want to put on there non-negotiable. And then you can't ever negotiate it. Because your action of trying to negotiate would make it negotiable. So you do not ever want to negotiate it. So you want to put it into a special deposit, special trust deposit, and you just want to let it sit there because the trustee has got to let it sit there. It's non commingable It's in-kind in, in-kind in back out again because sometime when I ask it for it back, I get the very same thing I put in back out again. So what good is it? I mean, I put a piece of paper in with some numbers and a name on it, and then I get that same piece of paper out. Yes. How does that buy me yes. apples and Now, was there a negotiation done? No. So now you don't fall under negotiable instrument law. Okay. You're not subject to UCC statutes and codes and other law merchants and statutes and codes in the U.S. because you didn't get effectively connected with anything. All right. So now that's held strictly on private because it's still private. Now, nobody knows anything about this. Because everything's done by special contracts, special private contracts. Kept on talking about these notional principal contracts. Well, these are these are private contracts. Everybody's got a silencing agreement. Nobody tells anything to anybody in anything because it'd be a breach of the contract, and it would make everybody liable for damages. So everybody is bound to silence. That keeps everything private. But yet you got this asset locked up for a specified amount of time. In effect, in a rental, and they're going to generate interest off of that special deposit. And you're going to gain access to the interest on the public side, and you're going to live off the interest generated off of that uh, interest generated off the public side, but it was drawn from the private side special deposit held on the private side, and none of them crossed it over. Okay, so because I signed a document uh, with my uh, real man name on it that gives them the right to do some kind of investments or some other thing? Yeah, okay, it's bond. They, they write a bond, so to speak, against it, which is just a promise. Yeah. It's an agreement that there's an asset locked up in special deposit for a trade for a certain length of time, say 40 weeks. They're going to generate these bonds and derivatives off of that, and these banks are going to sell these. And they're going to generate all this fiction currency, and they're going to give you interest on that rental of the use of your private instrument.
Does that make better sense? It does. It sounds really naughty. Though. Because you are a depositor lending money to the bank. Yes, you are the lender. Yeah. Did you hear me read the definition of the opening account? I did not. Okay, I'll let me read it again. Thank you. It's in the Bank Officer's Handbook, a commercial banking sixth edition by Milton R. Schroeder. It's in section 19.02. You have to go to a law library to get this, and they have different editions, but basically this is where all this old information is is that you need. And under Which section edition? three here, it says opening an account. It says opening an account in a bank involves only a simple contract. Now, the simple contract, that's your notional principal contracts on line 11 on the W8 Ben form. So opening an account in a bank involves only a simple contract in which the depositor lends money to the bank. Now, who's the lender? Yeah, I am. You are. So the depositor lends money to the bank in return for an agreement, there's that contract again, by the bank to pay back the amount either with or without interest. Well, the contracts I'm going to make are the ones with interest. Is there any uh, guidelines for setting the interest? On the trades that they do, you know, fiat currency is bound by Title 12 and Title 31 under USC, where you can only have a 10x fractionalization. So you put a million in, and they fractionalize it up to 10 million. On this side, there is no limit because it's private. So is that why the they can take, has take one dollar and multiply it up and pay the whole national debt of the world? Because there's no rules on this side of the game. It's all a cartoon. So is that why a mortgage note? Says has non-negotiable stamped on it. Yes, but that could be negated by the actions. If they negotiated that, then it turned a non-negotiable instrument into a negotiable instrument. So your actions can override your contracts or what you state on writing. I understand. So that's why we must have a private agreement specified out that everything is non-disclosure and everything is private. And if there is a breach of that disclosure, then there's financial tort actions and damages that will be instilled upon the breacher. I see. And who is this contract with? Whoever can do the tra transaction. The broker, with the broker, broker transaction, they barter exchange. So I just, so you're saying that I could take, um, uh, just take Microsoft Word and create a bond, private bond, um, with some nice fancy border and my name on it and sign it, make it for fifty billion dollars at uh, at hundred percent interest, deposit that in it for forty days, and boom, bada bing, bada bang, I got all that money to play with. That's right. Someone's got an open microphone in the background there. Yeah. It's echoing. Thank you. Yeah, we haven't learned how to work the board yet, but somebody who had the mic passed to them opened up, and then that opened up the conversation in the in the actual main meeting. Actually, we're, we're operating on the outside call and bridged into the main meeting because we haven't figured out how to use the sound system on the main meeting. Oh, okay. All right. Well, so it's just a matter of figuring out how then to communicate with this broker. And the broker no, I'm is more involved in that. It's really knowing how to, you know, create a negotiable 
versus a non-negotiable instrument and make sure that they're not commingled. Knowing how to do a special deposit, knowing trust basics, and knowing the how to administer a trust. And knowing how to administer a trust is really going to be through the IRS forms. So it's, I'm afraid it's a little more complicated than just, you know, going out and finding a broker and say, hey, here's my, my $50 million on my piece of toilet paper. Here, go negotiate it for me. <laughs> or deposit it and don't negotiate it. Yeah, right. Oh, Christian? Yeah, go ahead, Rana. Uh, this is uh, Jesus, sir. Oh, who is this again? Jesus. Jesus, oh, okay. Go ahead. Uh, uh, so basically what I'm kind of understanding is that in an account that there's, uh, if there's a, an account that's already open, let's say I created some net instrument trying to settle on my, basically, if I'm understanding you correctly, and you can correct me at the end, but I'm going to kind of go through what I understand. When you, when you accept for value your presentment, you try to use that into this trust that you've created, or, or basically into a, a private account. So far, I don't know if I'm Good, yeah, I could do that, yeah. And in fact, I'm turning that acceptance for value document into a non-negotiable instrument and putting it into a special deposit in trust. In trust, right. Okay. And then you start collecting from the bank that you deposited the funds off of the interest uh, that you set up a bank them from a, You know, what we're talking about here is back office banking, and you got to get into the special crowd, so to speak, because it's, it's it's not like when you walk into a bank and say, okay, I got this deposit, here it is, you know, give me some interest. Right, no, I'm saying, yeah, we're talking treasury, treasury direct link to your trust. Or to your bank, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, it could be that. that kind yeah. of, I don't know if that's what you were referring to, but I guess, yeah, I'm saying link your bank to the treasury, your bank, in, in your bank, well, I'm sorry, you create also a trust of your own, what I understand to be the Sestigay Trust, or corporate, and then you deposit those funds to that trust. I'm just taking advantage of the, the, the trust account that already ex exists. Oh, so you wouldn't be creating? It's just identified by a colorable title called a birth certificate. Like you would have control of it? Or exists. I'm going to utilize it. So you, you would have control of it after you basically assign it to you via UCC? I always had control of it, except I never expressed the trust, which didn't give me the control. I always had the slippers like Dorothy had in The Wizard of Oz, wearing those magic slippers to get back to home anytime she wanted. I see. We always had the power. We always had the ability. We just never knew or understood it. And it all starts with trust. That must be via the UCC. No, not UCC. It's expressing the trust. I need to... You don't accept that trust via UCC? And then he who claims trust must prove trust. And once I prove the trust, then I got the right to make my special deposits and things. How do you express your trust? Just via some type of note? Well, I have to set up the the evidence, with the, which is the four elements of the trust, and have one of the methods of the formation so that I can prove that, and I have to have records of the, those facts. And if I have two records or two witnesses, then I can prove that fact that, say, that I'm the grantor in this, spe this spe specific trust. And until I do that, I'm not the one who has total access of that, that trust. It's being How used... Because how can you do that if through. your parents did? Or, you know what I mean? In, in your case, the trust or whatever the birth certificate was, you never created. You never were the transfer for it. Oh, I, I, I'm absolutely, I am the one who created that. Nobody else did. They did not create that. Whose signature's on it? So you're saying that the birth certificate that your parents signed for you when you were born that later a public official went and probably did something or signed it into their book in some way was your creation? Uh, you, well, uh, they were the mechanism to bring it into existence, but it was per my authorization. 
I was the grantor of it. No because fiction corporation can, has the right to do anything because they're totally fiction. They have no ability, no power, no right to do anything until some real man gives them the power of attorney through his signature. And whether it gives them a qualified or unqualified signature, gives them access or not to the account. So the parents are signed on behalf of the baby. And so the like baby is the one that the energy into it. Yeah, we've got two people on here at once now. Uh, the other fellow was speaking first. Could you hold your question just until he's done? Actually, no. What he said is actually, I think, in line with what I probably asked, but I guess I just wanted to add one last thing with what, with what he was saying. It would be he, They would be acting as power of attorney, the parents would? Well, this is kind of like the spillover trust that at 18, you 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 got it all, but you just never knew you had it. You never expressed it, so you don't have control of it. So you drop the ball. They must pick that ball up and do something with it, and they're going to do the best that they can with what they got on their own biased bent. And they're going to do everything on that trust funds to, you know, utilize it for themselves. But really, they must hold it in trust, and they still have, and it still is in trust. It's still all waiting there for you. And they've really done a good job of taking care of it all. They've written bonds against it. They've invested those bonds. They've made it grow. It's multiplied. And they still have the original amounts and more. So, okay. So I'm still kind of confused on how you express that trust. It were, if it wasn't via UCC. Well, that's where the uh, trust basics comes in, and I would suggest you get Gilbert's Law Summaries on Trust, and it's, it's, start studying that. And going over some of the past downloads for, uh, when we came out with the NTT debut uh, about two months ago, send me an email at movingtitles at hushmail.com. Yes, I think it's a couple, but I haven't gotten responses yet, so I don't know. Well, ask me for the request for the audios. I'll send you the links. Okay. If you don't ask me specific for the request of the audios, you know. Uh, okay. Hey, Christian. Yeah, Rhonda. Uh, yeah, Miss Rhonda. Uh, listen, everybody here talking about the birth certificate and Social Security trust and all that. Correct me if I'm wrong, but that's all on the public side. Right. And the the trust that I want to express is the Declaration of Independence on the private side. Right. Yeah, the Declaration of Independence is the master trust. That's the one that says that I have all the unalienable rights given to me by God, period. Can't be a lien. And lien means to be transferred. Can't transfer any of my rights, period. And that was pre seventeen ninety one United States, statutes and codes. And if I choose that law form to be my law form, then that's that's what it is. Uh there was a gentleman there before you run did, did you have a question yet, sir? Uh, yeah. I, I have a question. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Um, if the, if uh, the birth certificate created this trust and the government has been... No, the birth certificate did not create this trust. The real man created this trust. The real man created the trust, but the birth certificate indicates or simply gives a label to it. Is that yeah. correct? Correct. Correct. It's an identifier for it. Yes. But gave, then, then, and the government has been using bonds or writing and something, uh, churning, creating uh, funds for that trust on the public side, right? So is public debt is that? Oh, I see. So that is not something that I would want to access. You're saying not the public debt, no, because that effectively connects you back into the United States business or trade. I see. Can I somehow cancel some of that debt, or I just don't want it? So that's, that's well, that was the whole purpose for House Joint Resolution 192, because that was supposed to be the relief valve of the pressure that we could create on the upward swing of creating more debt, which was the money we were using, to get us past some kind of emergency. 
But then they never released the debt back down by letting us discharge it and bringing it down to more reasonable levels. So, yeah, I can come down and I could release all the debt. But then, you know, you have to do it within reasonable means because the debt is what they're all operating on with as money today. Because really, we created a perfect system. We created the ability to manufacture as much money as we wanted to do anything for any amount, period. Really, is a perfect system. But where the abuse comes in is they're not allowing it to balance out, release the debt back to more manageable levels. Continue on where you were. So then, is um, if so, it is possible to release that debt if one knows how to do it. Yes. Do you know how to do that? Uh, yes, we're we're going to. <laughs> okay. Sounds to me like it would be most effective if a lot of people did a little bit each, rather than one person trying to do all of it. Yeah. Somebody would do their fair of the of the debt. Everybody does their fair share of the debt. Yeah. It would be nice to know how to do that. I don't quite have a clear picture of that yet. Well, keep sticking with us. All right. And then um, charging this uh, private site account is simply putting an instrument in there that the bank can profit from. So they're going to be happy because they've got something from a warm body that they can invest and sell in the market and generate interest off of. And I'm going to be happy because that's going to generate interest into my account that then I can uh, write some checks against or bills of exchange or somehow I can tap into that and buy potatoes and corn. Right, right. The interest is generated solely on the public side. You're going to deposit that into your LLC account or main checking account or whatever it is that you set up for this and then you just write checks for the goods and services that you that you consume that you buy sure. it sounds like a great idea just the devil is always in the details well actually it's not so hard if you really have been doing the study and you understand that you know it it makes more it, go, it goes easier the more exercise that you do but the hard part was getting up that mountaintop to the plateau, because that was a climb. Hey, Christian? Yes, go ahead. Wh who's this? This is Jesus again. Um, no, I had a question in regards to what you, uh, the gentleman was just talking about. Um, how do you actually know when you've done your part of the public debt, in the sense that how, what do you see on your end that reflects the that? debt has actually been um, ledgered or appropriately ledgered, what would you see on your end? Well, I would say, that? you know, show me the accounting. I mean, trustee's duty is to let the beneficiary know the accounting. If he didn't, that would be a breach of, you know, fiduciary duty, breach of trust. So are you technically able to, when you create this new trust where you're becoming the well, or you were the grantor in that sense, but where you're managing now or, or you're having someone assigned to send you that information, would you be able to see all of your public debt? Would they be yes. showing you all of that? Good trust uh, and trust law, you would, in effect, you know, you would have the answer already. Because the trustee's duty, if you understood the trustee's duty, his duty is to do an accounting when the beneficiary asks. Uh, okay, I got another question. Go ahead. If a person is in bankruptcy, then the bankruptcy trustee does, is that the same trustee position that Geithner? Are they then operating on behalf of Geithner in a local uh, level? I would suppose that that is under Title Eleven, and it's a different type of bankruptcy than the bankruptcy the. 1933. Okay. So they wouldn't have access to the same records. I couldn't ask them to tell me what's going on in that trust. It's not the same. 
Uh, if you ask the right person, you can get the right information. So you're walking up in there in Title 11, and you're forming a trust right then and there, and you're you're forming this trust under statutes and codes, Title 11, which is the rules that you agreed to, you set up here for this bankruptcy proceeding. But you didn't have to do that. Didn't know, didn't understand. You just you just created another trust. You didn't even know it. <laughs> Most people didn't know they're going. They're forming a trust when they go into bankruptcy. Another right. another sub trust off another trust sub trust. You know the fact today that no lawful money exists. That means that nobody can complete any kind of contracts. Can't give value for consideration. Can't give any kind of completion on any contracts. What's left? Something has to come in and fill the void, and it, it's a trust. A trust fills the void where there's no money. So everything today is not operating under colorable contracts. It's operating under trust. And everything is a trust transaction. You're gifting things all the time into trust. Yeah, I mean, the fact that I can buy something at the grocery store with a dollar bill is that I'm trusting that they're going to accept it. Y yes. Yep. It's drawn against your signature that's held in special deposit and trust. Any other questions? So, so yeah, so at, at some point when you have everything established, you would be able to be using the interest collected from any account that you have open, correct? Uh, say that again. Um, when you have everything established, at some point you will be able to be collecting on the interest. But wouldn't that be starting? That wouldn't that be co uh, creating? For example, the the loan that you're making now to this bank for any account that you create or the trust that you created, wouldn't you be now if they? owe you in return, wouldn't you be forcing them to create debt again? Well, that's that's on the on the public side, the interest. But yeah, it's source. What is the source of that interest? Because there's where you have to go to the publication 515 and look where it's talking about the source that is not subject to withholding. Because if it's source Say the source of the interest is generated from foreign sources. It's not subject to withholding. It's not taxable. So that's where the source is. The first thing you got to go. Where is the source of anything that I'm doing? Where is it? Where is the source generated from? Is it generated from the private side, or is it generated from the public side? So if it's generated from the public side, it's public debt. It's debt or creditor. You're back under statutes and codes. You're a U.S. person. You're connected with U.S. trade or business. You're taxable. You put yourself back into the system. But if a source is drawn against private funds held in special deposit, foreign source. So if you were to file, um, you would, uh, if you were to file IRS forms, um, 1040 forms, it would be 1040 NR. No way. You put yourself right back under it. Okay, so how do you file? Is there any way that you file any? Uh, Where am I filing anything? Or do I have any income that's subject to U.S.? No. Uh, okay, in that system you would. I understand. Once you get that set up, but before that, it doesn't matter then whether you file 1040 or 1040 NR forms. You're still in the system until you get Correct. yourself out of the system by Correct. charging that uh, trust and then getting into those funds. Right. That's why it's important. Once we get out of the system, once we get off this treadmill, we got to be particularly careful that we do not commingle the funds again and get ourselves connected back into the same system that we just jumped off of. And that's going to be through the understanding of how to administer the trust and through the IRS forms. So assuming the perfect situation that you've gotten out of all debt, let's say, you're clean, and now you're about to go do business and even collect those private funds that you're referring to. Where would you be putting those back into the public, or let's say your daily food, how would you be administering those funds with a small business, for example? 
businesses, but yeah, a house or car, something like that. Well, a small business, that's an altogether different because if I got a small business, that entity is going to be either getting me back in the whole thing again or else I got to keep it separate from me. No, I'm, Another sorry, I'm sorry. I didn't mean you as a small business. I meant if you go and let's say buy some food at the at the grocery store, something small that you're not necessarily okay. doing something. So I have I have a special deposit of uh, my non-negotiable debt instrument held in, in in the private, which in the public is going to generate me interest. The broker is going to transfer the interest into my account that I have specially set up, say an LLC account, a separate entity. That that is the sole use of that funds, the interest transferred, and that's where it goes, and that's all I use it for is for purchases, for goods and service necessary to sustain the real man. I see. And I never make any outward purchases to, say, go out and buy real estate or a, 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 a I don't know, say real estate, a, a business as income, because if I'm going to generate profits or I'm going to do business, then I'm going to be taxable, and I better not have that entity tied up in with that. Because I'm going to wreck everything that I've set up. But you could set up a separate entity to a do that. Entity. Entity. Sort of a business entity. Yes, a separate entity. And that separate entity is by itself, and it alone is taxable. And it pays tax. Okay. So if I wanted to buy land, or cars, or... Uh, well, consumption. Whatever I want to buy... I would do it through that separate business of either a corporation or something. All right, so if we're talking about business, yeah, it has to be separate. So how would the funds go then from that private account into the business that is buying the property well, really, or the automobile? If you stop and think about it, I really don't need a business. Why do I need a business? If I have access to unlimited funds, why do I need a business? Well, that's my question. That, that's a very good question. I mean, so, okay, suppose I want to open a grocery store or a homeless shelter or I want to buy a farm. Uh, I would, you know, as long as we're using acre. it to help somebody else, then that would be a legitimate thing that uh, we're trying to pass it through to somebody else and cause somebody else less distress or harm. Then that would be a worthwhile project. So how do I find that? How do I how do I make, get access to that money? Because under the acceptance for value, a better scenario would be why don't you just teach somebody else how to do this? And they can do it themselves. Why do I need to teach? Why do I have to feed somebody? It's better to teach somebody how to fish. Well, uh, I mean, uh, I want to. I w suppose I want to open a homeless shelter. I need to buy the building. I mean, I can't go down and teach all the homeless people. I mean, it takes some well, time we have to, to watch what we're doing that we don't effectively connect ourselves back in. You know, so it's got to be a separate entity that's you know going to be doing stuff. Yeah, I mean, it could be a corporation that does it, but how does the money get then from this um, uh, this public side, the interest earning side of this trust? How does that get into the corporation that is buying the land or the uh, homeless shelter or the whatever it is that it's buying? We're kind of getting way ahead of ourselves, aren't we? But you'd probably create another trust and uh, put a financial asset in there and trust it into that. Oh, I see. I see. I see. Okay, that makes sense. Well, it's it's what information you seem to have available. I'm not. I mean, I, I asked. I mean, I'm not. Do you have the details? That's what I would be more interested in. Is all the details of how to. Uh, yeah, charge the I'll start with you know, Gilbert's tr uh, law summaries on trusts and some of the other donations that I'll be, you know, giving out, you know, read everything you can, get a hold of on trust. Yeah. Yeah, good study. Mind that everything you're probably reading is all statutory. Yep. But we want to apply it under private instead of the statutory. So that's Gilbert's is the private side of trust. No, that's statutory, but it's a good example. Gilbert's is all statutory. It'll give you a good example of, because what you're doing is you're studying the black. And if you study black long enough, as soon as you see white, you'll recognize it right off. Hmm. You know, God first teaches you who he is not, so therefore you know who he is. 
He teaches you evil as a contrast. So that as soon as you see the good, you recognize it. If I teach you the black, you will know white by sight. So if I teach you statutory black law and you, you come across the white, you'll understand the white as soon as you see it. Christian. God teaches you who he is by who he is not. Go ahead, Rana. Yeah, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but the the interest that uh, that's in the public that you're utilizing uh, for the goods and services of the straw man, there's no problem with what you use that on as long as you're not generating money off those funds. As a profit or a business, yes. So you could go buy a piece of land with with those public funds because it's all public land anyway, right? And as, but as long as you don't use that public or that land that you bought to run a business, right? To, to generate profit, right? As long as its source of income is not derived from U.S. trade or business, making it tax. Anybody else? Yeah, I had another question there, Christian. Is that easy again? Um, so most most people would have been talking kind of about future, and I don't know if I could bring in a personal question regarding present. Go ahead. Is that okay? So so the question that I have is, you know, for example, do do can we use um, situations that we have right now pending? Um, already, or do we have to wait until we've corrected everything within this trust that you're talking about? Well, you could take and treat your issue that you're going through now and treat it as a trust, turn it into a trust, and possibly settle it as a trust. So if, in my case, and we spoke about this in, uh, I think, one of Greg's shows, um, but I spoke about a default process that I was going through with my mortgage, which I've already now done. So I sent them the non-response and default, but I have not created a trust yet. I have not converted it or moved title yet. Yeah, it's always been a trust. You just never expressed it as a trust. Correct. You never so claimed it to be a trust, and you never created the uh, the proof that you needed to prove the trust. Right. It's so been a trust all along. On. Right, and so now I don't know what... I've kind of been stuck on what processes to follow up with other than from what I understood before, and now I'm kind of... I don't know if I'm hearing different, but I understood that as a grantor, I still have the availability to change myself instead of being the beneficiary to the trustee and probably void the trust or create a new one, making the trustee maybe the attorney general, I'm not sure, and then having them to be the, the, grant, the beneficiary, of that being them being the bank, the trustee, you know, MERS, or anybody involved. See, if I have a particular issue, and I want to treat that issue instead of going all the way back to the source of the cause of it, I want to like make one step backwards and, it, and attack it for what it was, because it in itself is a trust. And until I express it being a trust and prove that it is a trust, then I have to stand and come in and make the claim that the trustee didn't do his duty. Then I could merge the titles on that trust and collapse that tr or terminate that trust, and then the trustee is liable for doing the distribution, or I could come in and compel him to do his duty as a trustee under equity and get him to disperse the funds that way. I have two options there. The whole thing is to come in and express it as being a trust and prove it it is a trust, that the law will recognize it being a trust. Now you got them between a rock and a hard spot, and you're the 900-pound gorilla, and they know they got a problem then because now you know what's going on. So you have to express it as a trust and then force them to show that they don't have it correctly expressed by basically saying oh, this is how it is. First of all, they have a higher trust, you're the trustee, and they're here all along say you're the beneficiary. But you've got to come in with proof. If you make the claim on the beneficiary, you've got to come in with a proof. Because he who claims trust must prove trust. How do you prove it? By, force it by saying your claim and then saying unless you have a higher claim than this. Mm. That's nothing more than just an NOI, which is a notice of interest. In other words, say, I'm, I'm beneficiary. So, so what? Where's your proof? I don't see any trust here. 
How are you going to prove a trust? You're going to have some kind of record created that proves that you are the beneficiary. And there's where you got to get the outside of the box thinking and get your minds in gear. How do I create a record that's going to be the proof that I need to prove that I'm, a, I'm the beneficiary or that I'm the grantor? Negative affirmative? Well, first of all, if I have a court case, you know, UCC, going back to that, 3-105 says that anybody who signs the instrument, they're the maker or the drawer of the instrument. And the same thing I keep going over on the other shows on a uh, bankruptcy case in out of Nevada. The, uh, the bankruptcy said that the one who signs the note is the trustor. And who's the trustor? He's the grantor. We are. Yeah, we are. No fiction can do anything without somebody signing, and whoever signs is the grantor because everything is a trust. Whatever you put your signature to, you are creating a trust. And how you created your signature, whether you gave it a qualified signature or an unqualified signature, determines the start of the expression of the trust. So your record to prove that you're the grantor is the original document that you signed. In this particular case, what is the original document that you signed? Birth certificate? No, this particular case. You're going back too far. Promissory note. Yeah, the promissory note. But let's go back a little farther. How about the application to the, the loan? Yeah, that's what I was thinking. Yep. That was the first signature you put on the whole deal. That set the whole thing up. You gave them power of attorney at that point. You gave them a negotiable instrument that they created funds from that they generated and gave back to the trustee at closing. Before you even signed the note, the title company had funds available. Where do you think they got those funds from? Your application. So how do you get the copies of that application so that you can accept that? Well, don't you have a filing, a county court record a filing of certified documents already someplace? that you can pull out certified that is a public record to begin with? Oh, yeah. Isn't That's that documentation to prove that you are the grantor on the trust? Certified copy of it in the, in the county. Right. There's certified two witnesses. You need two records. you got to get two records here. Well, Christian, the, the, uh, the application Sorry. itself is not uh, public. Um, you would have to go probably back to your title company to get a copy of it or your original documents that they gave you at closing. Right, right. Um, but the, the, the application itself is not uh, public. The mortgage certainly is, um, as we all know, but the application itself um, would not be something that you can go to public documents to retrieve. So if you have a copy or you have the originals that you signed or copies of the originals, you know, you, you'd have to attest those copies yourself. Or take an, uh, and do a notice filing in the county recorder that th these existence exist in the private and pull out a certified copy of that. There's, a, there's your other record. And do a UCC. Say that again. I'm sorry, what were the two? You, you really want to do a UCC1 for one record and a, a county recorder for the second record. Two witnesses. Oh, oh I see. But that's about while you express the trust. Yeah, if you can't get a certified copy of it, you need to create a title if it doesn't exist already. And then once you created the title, then you need to claim the title. You claim the title on a UCC-1 and a county recording. Do, do, do these default documents that I have on the bank serve me as record to indicate on that claim or that expression of trust? Can I use that later even though time is bound? Well, once I made a claim that I'm the grantor and the beneficiary on this trust, and I'm the one who has standing to make a claim as beneficiary, now I'm going to order the deposit back, my note back. Now you put them between a rock and a hard spot because that was put into special deposit, still sitting in special deposit, and they've been investing in it, and they should still have it, but I'll guarantee you they'll never give it back to you. But now you got them between a rock and a hard spot, and if you look under 9-336, they commingle the funds if they did a securitization under UCC, and that securitization is proof that they commingled it, and a commingling is a proof that the trustee breached his duty so they never will come across that. They will never give you the note back. But you can use that as leverage to get the house and probably some damages because they'll settle out of court first.
But how do you eliminate the debt, though? Well, you should eliminate the debt and have told them to apply it to the uh, other side, paying the house, and then give you a reconveyance of the deed. Right. Hey, Christian, on this UCC-1, the debtor would be the uh, bank because they're they're holding the original... Uh, whoa, 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 let's back up here. That's under misconstruement. Remember the definition I just set out of Banker's Handbook? Who's the lender? You are. Okay. See, that, that was all just an insurance policy against closing that if you didn't make the expression of the trust and tell them with the instructions what to do with the note to cross it from one side of the asset side to the other side, paying the debt. When you didn't do that, they said, okay, in case you don't do that, we have to have an insurance policy. And the insurance policy is a UCC1 filing of your security agreement a promise for you to pay such and such a payments for the next 30 years, all because you never expressed the trust. Now your three-year payment, your UCC-1 filing becomes a debtor-creditor relationship, and all along it was a trust deposit, a trust receipt. Look up trust receipt in Black's Law 8. You look up trust and then look up trust receipt. And which UCC you said? 9-336? Yes, 9-336. Yeah, that, that's commingling. And then the other one you said was UCC 1-105? Um, 3-105. 3-105. That's the proof that you're the grantor on the instrument that you sign. Anything you put your signature is a trust, and anything you sign, you are granting. Uh, where does the uh, uh, certifi sorry, cert certificate of title come into play versus the note in escrow? The, certified, the certificate of title in escrow, where does that come into play? Your certificate of title in escrow. I don't know what you mean. So they, the banks usually, when you did not uh, show them that you knew that you were the lender of funds, they basically made, basic, they basically went to an escrow company, in my case, and they tried to make an embargo between more financial companies than just me and the bank. Yeah, well, a after the deal was done, you, you gave them the notes, and then they recorded for you on behalf of you, because you gave them power of attorney, they turned your bill of sale into a uh, warranty deed. Or there you created another trust. Another trust again. Making yourself trustee and the county the beneficiary. And now it's the county and the bank coming at you in foreclosure. So that is so basically, that's a whole other trust in itself. I basically oh, another trust. After them for the note and um, the mortgage, basically, or, or what you call the deed of trust. Yeah, you got multiple trusts here. Right. And so, so to get that certificate of title out of that escrow company, I would have to assign <laughs> another trust in that this other trust now to let them know that what they are the beneficiary. Well, in the, that bankruptcy case said that the signer or the note was the trustor or the grantor, and the payee on the note was the beneficiary. But that's under construment, under debt of creditor. So the bank is the, the payee or the beneficiary. So on this trust, they're being construed as a beneficiary. Well, it's not really a bank, though. It's a title company. Well, see, here's what they did. They can't have, they can't be trustee also and beneficiary because any time that the beneficiary title and the legal title rest in one entity, the trust is terminated. So they were smart. Okay. It was they formed a a trustee being the title company, which was another entity separate from the bank because they can't hold both titles. 